Let's see. And all right. Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Brass, and this is the Brass Exchange with my two cents. I've had him on before. This It was years ago when I might talk to him on my other show, Purple Pill Philosophy, in that we had talked about um, libertarianism and cap and just general politics in general, along with a little bit of religion. In today's conversation, I would I noticed that we had he had been talking about a topic near and dear to me, which was the red pill and MGTOW and stuff like that. And, you know, so I decided, you know, why not, you know, rehash things, see where things have been going, and that's it. So tell um, the audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, everybody, I'm My Two Cents. Uh, and I've been pre- far less active over the past couple of years than I was just a few years ago. But I, uh, from about... 2017 to 2021, I was a YouTuber. I started talking primarily about uh, economics, particularly libertarian economics and anarcho capitalism. Although I ended up branching off into social issues, as I, I think something a lot of people who are passionate about economics and current uh, political issues quickly discover is that economic issues stem from social issues, in as much as the leverage the government has to take freedom away and the things that they are generally trying to accomplish are largely stem from the kinds of relationships people have outside the government. Uh, In in other words, when we we have traditional families where men are masculine and perform traditionally masculine roles and women are feminine and perform traditionally feminine roles, the need for government uh, intervention and, and protection is significantly less and the government can't get away with uh, seizing more freedoms from its citizens. So as part, as I've argued in my Defending Traditional Marriage series, any government that exists as it seeks to expand its control, its sphere of influence, and its control of resources, inevitably it must break down the nuclear family as part of its mission to consolidate its power. And for that reason, it, it does this in many various ways, one of which is through uh, ideological feminism and trying to reject traditional gender roles, which inevitably destroys the family. And for that reason, I think if you're passionate about free market economics and, you know, free, uh, freedom of the individual, you need to be, you need to understand the red pill. You need to understand uh, how men and women operate, why the nuclear family really is the best option for society and why the government actually wants to destroy the nuclear family in an effort to consolidate its power. Uh, so that's re- that's why over the past few years, I've shifted from doing a lot of strictly economic content to doing more men's issues, red pill, that kind of stuff, because the two are inevitably related. All right. Yeah, well, you have to remember that um, politics is downstream from culture, and culture is downstream from pussy. (laughs) That it is, that it is. Um, Because, I mean, like, there was um, a guy named Aaron Clary that made that sort of logic, because it's sort of like, Men, like, the vast majority of men in today's society are basically simps. Mm-hmm. And, and they'll do whatever women tell them to do. And so, basically, when he says that culture is downstream from pussy, what he, like, basically, he means is that women will make demands of men. Men will go to seek that, you know, to fulfill those demands, and that ends up creating the culture that we tend to see. Sorry, that was my phone. That's fine. I thought that was like your girlfriend or something. Nope, sorry. I was, uh, I got a notification on my phone and didn't realize how loud the volume was. So that's fine. But yeah, so that's how I seen it, how politics is downstream from culture and culture is downstream from pussy. That is sort of how it goes is where that where basically women set the demands for men, men seek to get the to fulfill that demand, which ends up creating the culture, which ends up translating to politics. And Absolutely. So, incidentally, I'm a big fan of Aaron Clary's books, The Book of Numbers and The Menu. Uh, it's not to say I agree with him on everything, but that's the case with most people. I, I definitely recommend his work. Yeah. Um. But yeah. I remember another thing that it's funny how 
you've been also going after, like when it comes to the red pill, you've also been fighting up going after more traditional conservatives or trad cons. As Absolutely. Well, which, I mean, I, I, I completely love that. I've been going after those people for about maybe a year now. The thing I would say about the traditional conservatives that a lot of people don't realize and need to wake up to, and I, I say this as someone who was at one point in my life, I would have considered myself a traditional conservative, but the irony is that modern feminists and traditional conservatives are strange bedfellows. And what I mean by that is that despite allegedly them being enemies, traditional conservatives are in staunch agreement with feminists in, in a number of things, primarily that they they treat women like children and seem to think that it's the responsibility of men, the adult in the room, to stand up and fix all of women's problems. So they, they might disagree on, on, with one or two points of the feminists, but when it comes to how society should be structured uh, and what's wrong with society, they actually will end up clapping and agreeing with feminists in that Everything is always men's fault all the time. And regardless of how they claim to stand against feminism, they usually end up uh, just crapping all over men the exact same way. So they're effectively accomplishing the same thing as the feminists. It's well, yeah. What it's been said is, is that the left kills men with feminism. The right kills men with chivalry. Exactly. And, and they're not actually that different. When, when you look, when you look at the, the particulars, might be different, but when you look at how they view men and women, their the conception is ironically not that different. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've basically said that really the I like when when you look at feminism and men, and like and they wonder why a bunch of men are just stepping out from both of them and going after both of them. They seem to not realize is like. The ideal men that both feminism and tra traditional conservative is pushing nowadays is one that men just want nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. Because with feminism, basically the ideal man man under a feminist um, rubric is basically that of a mom mule. Basically just a guy that, you know, he'll give his wife the, the card and she'll, you know, she'll ring it up and everything like that. And then he just gets left carrying all the bags around her around the mall that mm -hmm. is that is basically the the ultimate man in feminist philosophy whereas with traditional conservatives basically the ideal man is a dead soldier yeah you know that's that's an interesting way to put it but yes uh tr the traditional conservative the ideal man is someone who always puts the needs of women above his own he's He's always self-sacrificing, always doing what's morally right, which turns out to be what's best for women as a whole. And he derives some sense of you know, moral purpose by deliberately hurting his own interests in order to help the interests of womankind as a whole, whether he personally benefits from him or not, from it or not. And it, it's you know, and because men are naturally driven by a sense of duty and honor, this will work to shame men into doing you. you you can shame men for a period of time into saying you need to do this because it's the right thing to do, because it's the honorable thing to do, because a real man does this. And that'll work for a while. But when men at large see that there are no, there's nothing objectively uh, in it for them, it's not working out uh, to their benefit. And in fact, it's actually hurting their bottom line to help total strangers who want nothing to do with them. Eventually, they start to wake up and say, wait a second, why is this my duty, period? Uh, because this is what men are supposed to do. It's their moral duty. Says who? Look, y women are, are deliberately digging themselves into holes and I'm sick of pulling them out so they can jump right back in at my own expense. I'm out. And really, the, yeah. the, the, the children of traditional conservatives are starting to do this. They're starting to follow men. Instead, they're following men like Andrew Tate. Now, one, one thing, ironically enough, I've had to gotten on a bunch of arguments on Twitter lately in which I appear to be defending Andrew Tate. Uh, I need to be clear on this absolute point. I think Andrew Tate is not a role model. I think he is a grifter who is uh, preying on young men who are serious minded, but naive and making money off of uh, making money off of them by promising that he can make their lives as awesome as, as his is. 
I don't think he's an honorable man. But what the traditional conservatives are not asking the question is why are they why is Tate so appealing to these young men? Why are they leaving our churches, leaving our homes and following Tate? If they'd actually asked that question, they might understand a little bit more of what the problem is, but they refuse. It's they, they refuse to even ask that question. Yeah. Well, you know what Andrew Tate's children would be called? Tater tots. Yep. I figured. <laughs> uh yeah, and I remember, you know, you've been having a little crush on, on Pearly Things as well on, on Twitter as lately. Well, yeah, actually, Pearly Things blocked me. So uh, I started basically in the course, I, I had never, ever directly interacted with Pearly Things. And in the course of about two days when I started uh, commenting on her tweets and tagging her in statements I was making, she blocked me. So it, basically what, what I pointed out is Pearly Things is... The best pearly things is a grifter, and I'm not afraid to say that. The, the, but the thing a lot of people don't realize is the best grifts are 90 to 95 percent true. If it, people aren't going to follow you if you if you say something totally outrageous that just doesn't make any sense at all. So the the best grifters are the ones that can give you a core base of truth and then subtly attach more and more extreme ideas to it until their followers can no longer distinguish between what's true and what's false. In the case of pearl. She said she she does in fact say a lot of true things. I'm not I'm not saying that everything she puts out is garbage, but she if you look at her content, she always she after putting out you know some core red pill stuff, she then just goes to the most extreme outrageous positions, like you know it's I think it's okay for men to cheat. Uh, her this thing that happened, I guess, where she, she sang a anti-Semitic song, but inspired by Nick Fuentes or all this other just really out there stuff where I think she's just trying to be as extreme as possible to get as many clicks, get as many views and try to make as much money as she possibly can. Now, strict, I don't have a problem with people making money. Uh, it's if you're selling a product and people want it, I mean, so be it. But why I say, why do I say Pearl is a grifter? Because if you look if, if people have done research into her, they've looked at how she lives her life compared to what she says on screen. And she is a total hypocrite. On one hand, she tries, she preaches, you know, women should be pure and virgins till they're married, but she's not, uh, she is not herself a virgin. She laughs when asked what her body count is. She admits that she, she admits she's out chasing high value men, just like all the women she's condemning. And it's, I mean, when you're that much of a hypocrite, all I can say is you don't really believe what you're saying. You're just saying it. You're just trying to appeal to the broadest audience to make the most money. And that's what makes you a grifter. Well, yeah. It, well, I mean, it should be noticed that it should not be said that, well, because she's a hypocrite, therefore she's wrong. Because that would be a two-quo fallacy. Right. And I'm, I'm not I'm not saying because she's a hypocrite, she's wrong. She does, in fact, put out a lot of true information. But when you see, but when you see that she's not living the life that she's preaching to everyone else, I question whether or not she even really believes what she's preaching. Clearly, she's... In my, I mean, certainly this is my opinion, uh, and if, if someone wants to try and prove me wrong, so be it. But I would, I would encourage everyone to look at, at like the expose that was done by Brittany Venti and further expounded upon by Abba and Preach, and just say, does it look like Pearl actually believes what she says, or is she saying what she thinks is going to get the most simps and therefore the most money? And I have to say, I think it's the latter. Um, yeah, I definitely can see that. I mean, basically, that's a strategy that. Uh, a lot of women are doing is where they just try to get the most simps ever. And, and who could argue with them? They're making a lot of money off of it. Well, yeah. Well, simping isn't pimping, bro. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, I always just found it. I mean, I did, I did find it funny because I also listen to guys like Donovan Sharp as well. And a big way that he tends to defend pearly things is he'll say, well, people are just jealous of the fact that she was raised wealthy. And, mm -hmm. she's, and she's just found a way to capitalize on the market that's been there. Yeah, well, you know, I, I wouldn't exactly trust Jonathan Sharp for those kind of assessments. I, I would see Jonathan Sharp as a grifter as well, uh, especially since it came out that he's married to a single mother who's older than he is and uh, not nearly as hot as he implied that she was for a very long time. So again, being the fact that you're a hypocrite doesn't mean you're wrong. He, he very, he says a lot of 
there's a lot of good information on his channel too. But it just gets to a point where uh, when you're exposed like that and you can see that these people are not living by the values that they espouse. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's just it's just a drift. They're, they're trying to make money. And I don't I don't have any respect for that. Well, yeah, well, I mean, it's sort of like how when it comes to the whole hypocrite thing, like I brought that up more because that's a common response that people will give about it. It is because it's like if a person tells you that smoking is bad for you and i've literally had people that have done this to me where they'll literally say well you know smoking will shorten your life and stuff all the while they're holding up they have a pack of cigarettes and a and a cigarette in their mouth and you know so it would be fallacious to say oh well you you know you're smoking cigarettes so therefore you're wrong about smoking being bad for you because you you wouldn't be doing it if it what if you believed it was, um, if you believed it was unhealthy. But, I mean, that's sort of where the whole two quote thing comes in. I brought that up because that's a common point people that defend her will say. Mm hmm. And, and when, when it comes down to it, if you love Pearl's co content so much, you want to see her make more of it. You're willing to donate money to her. It's your money, man. Th 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 that's up to you. I would just encourage you. I think there are better things you could do with that money to improve yourself. The The red pill is, I, I firmly am behind the core base of what the red pill is, but I think many creators in the red pill space are just trying to exploit the desperation a lot of, of a lot of young men. Uh, they promise, especially these ones that are selling you courses and making promises that if you just give them outrageous amounts of money, they can turn you into a super alpha male who gets all the women he wants. It, it, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. I guarantee you, what, whatever they're selling you, it's not going to deliver on what they promise. You're just going to be worse off for having lost the money and, they, and they're and uh, they laughing at you in the background. So. Yeah. You mean you probably could just use the money to get a girlfriend and whatever? Exactly. Like all things, there's that 90% core base of truth. It's when they take it the extra step and start making promises they can't deliver on that they become a grifter. Or, or I guess in, in the case, I would say a grifter is both someone who's trying to swindle you out of your money with a product they know they can't deliver on, or someone who doesn't even really believe what they're saying. They just think it's going to get them the most clicks and the most donations. So, so basically, a politician. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly like a politician. Um, but yeah, um, and I always do find that funny how there is a bit of a coincide because I remember how. When it comes to, a lot of times they bring up politics, but at the same time they don't want to seem like they're making political policy suggestions when they clearly are. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also, so I mean, well, anyway, what got you into the whole MGTOW thing? Because, like you said, you used to be a more conservative Christian, so like. What changed your mind and got you out of it? I would say on a personal level, in my early, in my late teens and early 20s, uh, I went through the same phase that many young men do in that i have been told all my life by my mother that if you just are a true gentleman and are always kind to women, do what's best for them, put their needs in uh, before, uh, first, you will you know, you will be rewarded. Not, it doesn't mean every girl is going to like you, but the ones that are worth it, they'll like you because real, you know, good women like nice guys. Uh, so long as you do that, you never, you need not fear divorce. You need not uh, fear, uh, you, know, you need not fear false accusations of sexual assault or any of the other things that many modern men uh, suffer with. And further, men that tell you, you need to guard yourself, you need to protect yourself from women who intend to make false accusations or who will take advantage of you and let you buy them things without any uh, intention of being in a relationship with you or, uh, or who, or for example, if a woman does divorce a man, it must be because he was a you know horrible narcissistic abuser. Uh, and so long as you ally yourself with women uh, and protecting them against bad men, you're, you're, you'll shine, you'll get a, the wife of your dreams and everything will turn out great. Well, I in, pra I, in practice, saw that this wasn't true. Uh, between a number of girls I dated, I had a lot of bad experiences. And I, I thought to myself, I saw what was happening to close friends and associates. 
who are going through divorce and accusations of being abusive and things of this nature. And I realized, you know, this just isn't adding up. What's the deal? Uh, I started doing my own research. One of the first uh, red pill creators I came across was a guy called Dal Rock. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, he's a blogger who no longer blogs, but all his content is still up there and it's a lot of great stuff. And, uh, the more research I did, uh, I, I came across what is called the red pill. I mean, I, I encountered many creators, some of which I agree with on some things uh, more than others, but really the core base, I, I discovered that when you look at the world, if, if you have a certain set of information that is allegedly true, but in practice, you see it's not panning out. Odds are the core base of information you thought was true isn't the right. Maybe, actually, let me, let me backtrack. It's maybe a better analogy. If you're trying to get, if you're traveling across the country and you're trying to go from one destination to another and you have a roadmap that says this is all you have to do to get there. And as you follow this map, you're, you're more and more lost and you just can't figure it out. Odds are your map might be wrong. It's not actually taking you where you need to go. On the other hand, if you can get the correct map, you get another map and it takes you exactly where you want to go. You realize, you know, this is the map I needed to be uh, working from, not the other. And the same can be true with paradigms, if you will. Uh, if the, the core base of truth, the lens through which you're viewing the world isn't adding up, you need to question whether or not that what you've been taught is really true. And I think the same is true with the red pill and the whole uh, pro the feminist narrative that women are all sugar and spice and everything nice and that anything bad that happens to a man must be his fault because he, he wasn't a he must be a horrible abusive terrible uh man you when in practice you see that it doesn't matter how much you ally yourself with traditional conservative causes or feminist causes or anything else these people preach you end up crashing and burning and and getting burned by women over and over again that's probably not the right way to view the world the red pill on the other hand uh, if you accept the tenets of the red pill i i challenge anyone to look at the core uh, tenets of the red pill, and maybe we can talk about that in a second, but then look at all the relationships in your life, the ones that have succeeded, the ones that have failed, people you know well, or even are just acquaintances of, and ask the question, can the behaviors in this relationship be explained by the, co uh, by the core tenets of the red pill? I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is yes. Are there always exceptions? Sure, but uh, the exceptions tend to prove the rule, not disprove it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know a woman that's recently single that you that you could probably have a shot with. And who is that? Night Shift's ex. <laughs> you, you may tell her I'm not interested. <laughs> uh, yeah. When I had him on for my show, that was basically like, me and him, like I was basically just roasting him for a bit on that, and he and he was just taking it in stride. Well, good um, for him. Yeah, it was it was just a, it was a fun time, um, and uh, yeah, but I mean, what's funny is is like basically whenever I talk about it, I always make sure to, to just tell people like all men have have this had at least had an experience like this where they see women through rose colored glasses and get burned from that. So absolutely. So, I mean, even in my own experience, like for some strange reason, I thought that getting with a girl that I met in a mental health group was a great idea. And come to find out she was crazy. Well, you did meet at a mental health group, so. <laughs> yeah, but I know. But, but you know what? I'm not one to judge because, like you said, we've all done it. Uh, every man at some point in his life uh, wants so badly to believe that he's found a uh, Walt. Uh, not all women are like that. The perfect angel who, you know, if he just does all the right things, they'll live happily ever after. He gets burned, and uh, hopefully he'll open his eyes and come to understand female nature after that. Well, my two cents. She was different. She loved me. Yes, I'm sure she did. <laughs> but of course, part of the red pill is men and women love differently. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's true as well, because I've often realized, like, I mean, what's funny is, is like, I've, there's actually been studies on this where they've showed if you have, like, four different groups where you have man, men marrying women, 
men marrying men, women marrying men, and women marrying um, women, those four groups, where basically whenever the the group that has the highest divorce rate is lesbians. Yes, actually, I, I have seen those same studies. Yeah, and the people and the and the ones that have the le- less ma- uh, the less divorces is actually gay men. Interesting. So basically, now, now, le- less divorces. Now I know what was interesting. The, the studies I've seen. What's interesting about gay men is that their relationships are not typically monogamous. They are both quote unquote cheating on each other, but they don't care. I mean, most gay most gay men relationships, uh, uh, they frequently have. Uh, casual relationships with other men as well, but neither one, it's like an open relationship is their typical model. Yeah. But I mean, like I was saying, like, typically, like, when they actually do it, it's like, um, heterosex, like, it goes like this, it goes like from highest divorces to lowest, it's highest divorce is lesbians, the middle point is heterosexuals, and then the lowest is gay men. Interesting. And So what I get from that is basically if you want to make a divorce happen quicker, just add a woman to it. (laughs) Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, because that seems to be the commonality. Once you add a woman to it, that's when the divorce goes up. Absolutely. And as it is in heterosexual relationships, women initiate at least 70% of all divorces and that number is higher if the woman is college educated. Yeah. and. Well, I mean, and here's what's funny that people don't even talk about when it comes, like, not even with divorce, but just with relationships in general. Women are more likely to be the dumper than the dumpy. Yes. And there have actually been evolutionary studies upon, like, on why that might be the case. And what it could be the case is that women, because, like, women are the ones that birth birth children they they stand to like if they get the wrong mate then they tend they have they're wasting more energy where and sometimes they may not know that they have the right the the wrong mate until even after they've already had one child with them and so they monkey branch as they say to to get a better deal Mm-hmm. And and I think if, if at this point it might be useful to talk about you know the, really simply what the red pill is if if you'd like to do that. Sure. Okay. So like you were saying there, we have basic evolutionary biology, and what, what the red pill is, and this is something that frequently frustrates me because I see it happening a lot, especially on Twitter lately, and that is that people outside the red pill seem to think that if you accept the red pill, you are a pickup artist. In other words, anyone who's a red pillar automatically thinks men should manipulate women and have sex with as many women as they possibly can, never get married, uh, you know, get a vasectomy as soon as you're out of high school, et cetera. That is not the case. The red pill, and and I like, as I'm sure everyone's pretty much aware at this point, the the term red pill comes from the movie The Matrix, where Morpheus offers Neo this symbolic choice of you either take the blue pill, uh, which... You wake up in bed and you can keep on believing the happy lie or you take the red pill and I show you the truth. And what, what, what caught me there is Morpheus says, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. So the red pill, I really see it, is the truth about male and female nature. What you do with that truth after the fact is up to you. And there are many different camps that men have split off into within the red pill. But the red pill is essentially this, accepting that men and women are different and both have different inherent biological drives and strategies for reproducing. If we go you know, way back in time, hundreds of thousands of years to the earliest stages of humanity, what, what is it that the average man and an average woman is concerned about? Well, it basically comes down to, we, we all have the same reproduce. Darwinism 101, eat, survive, reproduce, and you know, pass on your genes to the next generation. But when, and that, that is natural in as much as we know we're gonna die, and we we have this innate drive to leave a legacy. The question then is, with if I'm with for the man and for the woman, are there things that will inherently work out better or worse in order to ensure the greatest chance 
that you you are going to pass on your genes to the next generation and leave a legacy? And the answer is yes. You, it's a dangerous world, no modern technology, lots of dangerous animals that are constantly hunting you. You have to hunt them to try and survive. You know, terrible storms and mortality rates are very high in this primal world and uh, infant mortality rates are especially high. So what is the best way to go about reproducing and ensuring your genetic legacy? Well, for men, uh, the answer is pretty simple. Uh, men do not bear children and they can, uh, they can uh, fertilize eggs pretty much to the point uh, from the moment they go through puberty till they, uh, till they die, they can keep having children. So the best for the, if talking strictly for the individual man, the best strategy uh, to ensure uh, that you reproduce and ensure your genetic legacy is just simply have sex with every fertile woman you, you come across with, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Doesn't matter who she is, if she's female and she's fertile, have sex with her, and it can't hurt your chances that you have more children. Now, if you have, if such a man has sex with 100 women, you know, maybe, like I said, mortality rates are high. Maybe 25 of those women get killed by saber-toothed tigers. Uh, the 75 that give birth, another 50 of those infants don't survive past their first year. And when all is said and done, maybe only 10 of those children make it to adulthood. But that's another, that's 10 chances more than you had otherwise. So as you can see in that primal environment, it makes the best strategy for men is just if it's female, have sex with it. And that, that would explain why instinctively it seems men uh, are, can never be attracted to just one woman. And that even re no matter how ugly she is, if you ask a woman, if, if, you, if a woman goes up to a man and says, do you want to have sex? 95% of the time, the answer is yes, because regardless of how hideous she is, there's that uh, drive in the back of his mind. She's a female, she's fertile. It can't hurt my chances of reproducing. On the yeah. other hand, if you look at, uh, on the other hand, if you look at the average female uh, in that situation, she's biologically different. She can only have one child at a time. And further, once she's pregnant, having sex with another man can't change the DNA of the child in, in her womb. She has to uh, invest a minimum of nine months uh, just to have the child. And then, of course, years after that of raising the child until uh, he or she reaches a state of maturity that they can protect themselves. And further, remember, this is before modern technology. This is before government. This is before, before all the modern conveniences. Women being inherently physically weaker than men are largely dependent on men to protect them. Women without the protection of strong men that can protect them from nature and from the elements are pretty much setting ducks. So her strategy is to, unlike the man who really just has one biological imperative, mate with as many females as possible, a woman has two biological imperatives. Number one, mate with the most genetically superior male available. In other words, if her, if her children are gonna be healthy and strong, she's got to secure the genes of a man who is also healthy and strong, ideally the healthiest and strongest of all available to give her child the best chance at being a, a growing to adulthood. But two, beyond just the mere good genes, she also needs the commitment of a man to help protect her and that child, or else she's not going to be able to make it to adulthood. The child is not going to make it to adulthood, and odds are the woman's not going to survive for very long either. So we can see that these two biological drives are inherently competing with one another. Uh, a woman could, for example, just you know, have sex with the most genetically superior man and secure his child, and then find another man who's not so genetically uh, superior, but who's willing to protect her. And that would be a dual prong mating strategy. However, it's against uh, a man that doesn't really inherently, he doesn't care about some other guy's children. That's not his genetic legacy. How is it helping him? So most men by and large are not willing to just step in and take care of another man's woman and another man's child. They're going to let, they're just going to let her die and find a woman that can have his child. So women are forced to try and find the cream of the crop, someone who is good genes, but also is willing to give parental investment. Men, on the other hand, as much as they like to have sex with every woman they possibly can, except for those really, really top tier guys, most, uh, the vast majority of women are going to be extremely hesitant to give it up, even to that really, really top guy, unless they can first secure his commitment, which is how the, the marriage contract and the nuclear family naturally emerges. Yes, men and women's innate uh, urges are in conflict, but when they come together and make sacrifices for the greater good, the worst aspects of male, male nature are canceled out. The worst aspects of female nature are canceled out. They come together and work together and give their children the best chance at life possible. And that's why I believe in every culture around the world historically, the natural marriage relationship of man, woman, and children naturally emerges. 
It's only when we get to the modern age and modern technology and conveniences solve most of women's naturally occurring problems. We get the birth control pill, we get condoms that the reasons that which, and we get government agencies that step in and fill the role that a lot that men typically filled for women that we see feminism then arising and we see the natural biological instincts of men and women working to the detriment of one another because the family has been replaced by the government. Uh, but, but really the, all the red pill is, is accepting this, the, the simple truth. Men are naturally polygamous. Women are naturally hypergamous. This is not right or wrong. This is simply a statement of fact. And if you don't understand this, your relationship is doomed to fail. Yeah. Well, a point that I like to also bring up is like, you do bring up an interesting point where how, even though men have this drive to have sex with as many fertile women as they possibly can, you are also correct to note that it is very, the odds of any individual man acquiring a harem is astronomically low. Right. Uh, and, and this is like, funny enough, when people bring up the Bible, you can actually see this in the Bible. If you, if, if you see all the men in the Bible that practice polygamy, you can notice one defining trait about all of them. They're wealthy. Exactly. Um, for example, Moses, um, Jacob, Isaac, Abraham, Solomon, David. What do all these men have in common? They all practice polygamy and they were all wealthy as hell. Exactly. And in the case of David and Solomon, they were both kings of major nations. So, and, and that really, it's, it speaks to the fact women uh, being part of a harem is kind of, I would say is inherently against female nature in as much as so long as a woman knows she is competing with other women for a man's affection, her position is not secure. The only reason she's going to agree to this is if she believes that there, the benefit, there is, is some incredible benefit that comes to being with this particular man, as opposed to a man who is loyal to her. And in most cases, that's the protection and provision. You know, David's wives and Solomon's wives may not have had a lot of interaction with their husbands on a regular basis, but they lived in palaces that were guarded by, you know, the best trained soldiers in the army. They're, they wanted for nothing, and they were guaranteed that their children would be raised in luxury. Now, were these women happy? I would argue that they probably were not, you know, happy in the traditional sense of a woman who claims she's in love and enjoys the company of her husband. but they the their calculation was that the benefits outweighed whatever cost they were going to incur and it, as you know it really it, it doesn't matter how physically attractive a man is if unless he is extremely powerful and extremely wealthy the odds that he's going to have an actual harem are extremely low yeah and well i mean i also made this joke about it where i imagined solomon on the maury povet show <laughs> where basically Maury Povich says, Solomon, you claim to be the wisest man who ever lived. Your thousand marriages and concubines say have determined that that is a lie. And you know, for, for anyone who's, for any man who dreams about having a harem, I just wish I could have all the women I want. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. I, I mean, if you, if you look at Solomon was, it, 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 if there ever was a giga Chad, it was King Solomon. He had, you know, 700 wives, 300 concubines, uh, wealthiest man in the world at the time. And if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, he it is basically a lament about how meaningless his life is. He always had everything he wanted all the time, and he ultimately felt like an unfulfilled person. And I think uh, it goes to show that a, a life of hedonism, no matter how much you might crave it, is ultimately unfulfilling. Well, things pick up in the Songs of Solomon. Well, they certainly do, but uh, I would say of all the books he wrote, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes, I think most telling in his into the nature of his life was Ecclesiastes. Same. I think so, too. And, I mean, when it comes to also with King David, well, funny enough is that people will always end up going to his thing with um, Bathsheba. Yes. Yeah. And what I was like... If there is a big debate over whether or not like what he did with Bathsheba could be considered rape. Um, but generally I've saying, well, there's a big thing that people 
tend to leave out what he actually did with her husband. He sent her husband off to war to get killed. So that way, when he slept with Bathsheba, that wouldn't be adultery. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people have interpreted that story different ways. What I'm going to say is we can never know really how it went down. What I can say is this. Bathsheba went from being the wife of a soldier, a, a prominent soldier, perhaps. He was one of David's mighty men. But she went from being the wife of a soldier to the queen of Israel. Uh, and her son, went on, despite not being the firstborn, went on to become the next king. If you look at the end of Second Samuel and see how she behaves when working with the prophet Nathan to ensure that Solomon becomes the next king, she seems extremely intelligent and manipulative, which makes it very hard for me to believe that she was just an innocent maiden bathing on the roof, no idea the king was watching her. I think she was monkey branching, and it it worked. The pay, in her case, the payoff was immense. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, it's just sort of like I point out what he, what David did to, to her husband. Because, like, it's an example of how gynocentric our culture is, where the possible rape of, of a woman is seen as more important in our eyes than the, than the, yeah, there's no doubt about it. He basically murder, murder by proxy her husband. Absolutely. <laughs> so we but can't... People are more, con people, there was an actual murder, and they're more concerned about whether or not she consented. Yeah. So that does go to show you just how little people care about men's lives. Mm -hmm. um, when, yeah, oh, we could forgive proxy murder, but did he rape a woman? Oh, well, we need to know about that. Exactly. The lesson all men should learn from David, no matter how hot she is, learn to keep it in your pants. Because did it, he suffered quite a bit for uh, taking that one on. Yeah. Um. Also, I mean, I, I actually have been wanting to ask you this for a while, but does the power of Christ still compel you? Does the power of Christ still compel me? Uh, whenever I hear that statement, it's always in the term of some sort of exorcism. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how to answer that. What I can say is I am still a Bible-believing Christian, yes. Yeah, that's, yeah, you're the first Christian that's ever gotten that reference that I've talked to. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I would tell Christians that, and they were, and they would be like, "Well, yeah, I mean," and they would, they wouldn't get that I'm actually making a reference. Okay. Yeah, and I always just think about how. Um, I also think about. I try to tie it back to Adam and Eve as well, and people will ask, "Well, what was?" I make the joke, and I'll say, "They'll say, what was Adam?" Adam's sin, and they'll say eating the apple, and I say no, being a simp. Exactly, exactly. I, I have made the same joke before. Yeah, um, I say instead of calling it original sin, just call it original simp. Yes, the Adam, the original simp. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I always just found that sort of interesting how you can tie cultural stories into our current situations and people may want to deny it all they want but America does have like does embrace a lot of the Christian story oh they certainly do yeah and it is sort of even from a non-religious man like myself I acknowledge that sort of part and I think it's just sort of a uh, sort of funny how people just they they tend to be so inculcated in their culture and they're socialized that they don't really realize it yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and i've always found like how people generally don't really take seriously about how certain situations play out in cultures and they don't get the morality of it like for example, they'll often bring up about how the Bible must be sexist because of the fact how back in biblical times, adultery just meant that a man could only be, you know, found guilty of adultery if he slept with another woman's, I mean, with another man's wife. Whereas a woman could, if a woman slept with any man, she would be an, uh, she would be an adulteress. Well, that's not 
I'm not sure what you're referring to there because that's not exactly correct, but it would have to be a married woman who slept with any man would be an adulteress, but uh, yes, people don't understand the cultural context behind that. Well, yeah, well, I mean, what I'd like to tell people is like, the, the thing is like, people have this sort of, I mean, I remember I actually discussed this with you a bit on Twitter before and like, people have this assumption that men and women's like sexual dynamics are exactly the same and therefore when you point out like one thing being true of women is the and not for men that's sort of a double standard when in reality exactly. it's two different standards because they're two different kinds of people exactly men and women are different therefore when we treat men differently and we treat women differently it's not a double standard it's a reflection of the fact that men and women are different now, is that true in all cases? Not necessarily, but especially when it comes to sexual dynamics. I know the one we, the one that's very easy to point out is if a man has sex with many women, he's considered a stud and everyone high fives him. If a woman has sex with many men, she's a slut and she's shamed. Well, that is such a double standard. You know, Meghan Markle, Prince Harry's wonderful uh, bride who's changing the world, she made waves when she came out and said, we just need to stop this double standard of men being praised for sexual promiscuity and women being shamed. But that's not a double standard. It's a reflection of the fact that men and women are different. Men have a biological drive to want to have lots of sex. And as I said, that's why even the most attractive man who has had sex, if even if he has access to the most attractive girl, if another girl who is overweight and unattractive comes along and says, do you want to have sex? Odds are the answer is yes. Because his biological drive is to have sex with as many women as possible, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Women, on the other hand, uh, their biological drive is to seek out the highest value man. And since men everywhere are willing to have sex, a woman who has many sexual partners, that's not an accomplishment. It's like saying you should be praised for brushing your teeth in the morning. So what? You, <laughs> anybody can do that. It's, it's hard for a man to have sex with a lot of women. It's easy for a woman to have sex with a lot of men. And for that reason, that is not a double standard. Standard. I mean, I like to point out like this way. It's if a man, let's say if a man cheats on his, his wife with 10 virgin women, well, and he gets all of them pregnant. Well, we know who the father of those children are. Whereas if a woman ha has sex with 10 other, like she cheats on her, her husband with 10 other men. Well, we don't know who the father is immediately. Exactly. And you can say, well, DNA testing, but you have to remember that's a modern advancement. For most of human history, DNA testing wasn't an option. Yeah. And even with DNA testing, like, it might be a while before you, like, depending on how many men that she's been with, it could be a while before you actually find out who the actual father is. Mm -hmm. Now, another point I want to make is whether or not it's moral for a man to sleep with multiple women is an entirely separate question. And I think, especially in the religious sphere, a lot of people are uh, accuse me of saying, you're saying it's okay for men to sleep with multiple women. I've never said I thought it was moral. What I'm saying is it's a reflection of male nature. Again, male and female nature are not inherently right or wrong. They just are. Now, does that mean that any action taken by a man or a woman is necessarily the moral or correct thing to do? No, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying if you want to understand this, you have to understand what the natures are and why they're different. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, it's sort of like, I like to give this example. It's like, you're not saying that it's moral for men to sleep around with many women or that it's moral for women to sleep around with many men. You're just acknowledging that there's a difference between the two actions. Exactly. Exactly. And, I mean, it's sort of like this. Cutting off a man's leg is different than cutting off a man's arm. But we can both acknowledge that it's still wrong to do the to do both those things just for no good reason at all. Exactly. So it's not a statement of, oh, what well, well, you're saying that it's more, you're just acknowledging a difference. Mm -hmm. Um so and it's funny it's like people just don't want to admit the difference. And I remember a thing that Pearly thinks is getting a lot of trouble for is that she's saying that women shouldn't be allowed to vote. Yes. Um, I mean, personally speaking, you know, if voting actually meant anything, the pe the elites wouldn't let you do it. My, my answer to this question is a little more complex. Now, those of you, people who have followed me for a long time know I am an anarcho-capitalist. I believe all forms of government are inherently oppressive 
Uh, and I, I think voting is itself an act of violence. So I am not in support of voting, period. Now, now, that doesn't mean I can't answer the question, if we're going to have a democratically elected government of some sort, is there one form or another that would inherently work out better? So I, th I think the answer to that is yes. Even if I reject voting in principle, if we're going to have voting, is there a way I think it could turn out better? And the answer is yes. Now, would I, strictly speaking, be in favor of saying women can't vote, period? Not necessarily, but here is what I would say. I think that if we're going to have a democratic system, here are the rules that should qualify you for voting. You must, one, be a net taxpayer. In other words, I don't care whether or not taxes are technically deducted from your, from your paycheck. What I want to know is when all is said and done, when all government programs have, have ended, the amount of money you pay to the government does it exceed the amount of money you receive back from the government in any form of social program or social service? If the answer to that is yes, you effectively pay the government, then that should be one condition for you to vote. Condition number two, you need to be subject to the military draft. And I say, and the, the reason for this is basically, if you are going to vote for politicians who vote to raise taxes, that means that you will personally be paying the higher taxes. Also, if you vote for a politician who's gonna take you to war, there's a very real possibility that you'll be fighting in that war. Now, neither of those are a possibility, are, are certainty for men, but it virtually excludes all women because when you look at net, uh, most net taxpayers, yeah, that's going to be most that mo that's going to turn out to be mostly men. And if you look at those military draft, well, that's only men, and I don't see a whole lot of women volunteering to sign up for the draft. So I think that that would be a much more fair way of doing it. It wouldn't, strictly speaking, exclude women. But in practice, it would effectively exclude almost all women. Yeah. Well, basically, I like to point out this way. is like People seem to believe that the draft means only combat roles. And that doesn't... Like, Walter Williams himself, he wasn't really put... Like, he was drafted, but I believe he was... He did like he repaired airplanes. Exactly. Not everyone in the military is a, serves in the infantry. There are the military is a large organization that has many different jobs. Not all, all of which have some inherent risk of dying in combat, but some of which have a much more inherent risk. I.e., the infantry soldier versus you know the aircraft mechanic, as you mentioned. Yeah, or like you know. So I envision like even if women were subjected to the draft and there was a war and women did get drafted, what I would predict what would happen would be that most women would probably end up with jobs like being a cook or, you know, maybe maybe a drone pilot where they're behind, like, in a comfy office where they're just, like, using an Atari controller to, to just send, like, you know, bomb places from a distance. Like... I predict that's probably what they would do while men would be the ones that are on the front line. Absolutely. Like That's probably what would effectively happen, yes. Yeah, so basically you would have women making sandwiches while men are going off to war. So, I mean, because that's sort of how it's like in countries that do have a more egalitarian-style draft. I believe Israel has that sort of thing. Yes, w women are, I believe, are required to serve in Israel as well. Yeah, but and when people realize, like when they look through the how it works for women and men in the in the draft in Israel, like men are the ones that are doing most of the combat roles, and women tend to be the ones that are doing like the sort of office jobs, and they tend to be like the chefs. And I'm not saying that there is no inherent danger that could come with that job, because I mean. I know of situations where you've had chefs that are cooking and a bomb just drops right into the through a through a vent and it blows up. Exactly. If you're serving in the military, there is always the chance that you could be uh, you could die in combat. Yeah, so I'm not going to sit here and say there's no inherent risk. But I'm saying like there's a difference between you being a soldier and you hold a gun in your hand and you're going out there and shooting at people. And you instead of and you being a chef or something, yes, yeah, sure, you could both die in either situation, but your odds of dying go up dramatically in one over the other. And that's sort of how I see the situation when it comes to the draft. I don't really think that even if it was 
I was, so I mean, I think the whole notion that we can't have the draft because it would be unfair to send women to combat as a straw man because most likely women would not be sent to combat even if they were drafted. Yeah. Either way, it comes back to the principle for me. If you're going to vote to raise taxes, you need to be paying taxes. And if you're going to vote to go to war, you need to be subject to fighting in that war. Now, again, yes. I, again, I am not, I am an anarcho-capitalist. That does not mean I support democratic elections. All I'm commenting on is that if we're going to have democratic elections, that's going to be a much more uh, fair system than the one we currently have. There's something really wrong when people who pay no taxes at all can vote to raise the taxes that do. Yeah, and it's also another thing is when you have people that have literally no chance of getting drafted, getting to vote for Warhawk um, presidents who will draft who will use the draft in order to get to get people to get people other people to fight in wars. Exactly. Like, so I mean and women make up the majority of voters. So I've always given this analogy like it is very well possible that what could happen is that a major like you could have a a suave war hawk politician who can come in and he can make all these fancy promises to women and he could get enough of them to vote for him where he wins the election and becomes president. And his first thing that he does once he gets into office is he enacts a draft and gets all the men who most of them didn't support him that he drafts them into war. Mm -hmm. So basically you have one side of the equation that they have no chance of being drafted at the moment. And they're being given the power to elect a person who will then basically enslave the, the people that actually are going to be drafted. Exactly. And that's why I think that's sort of like, I mean, I'm more of like a principal guy when it is either the draft is either, the wrong or it's not wrong if it's wrong then no one should do it like no one should be applied to it but if it is right then everyone needs to, to it needs to be everyone needs to be subject to it i would agree so i mean it's sort of like how when it comes to the the transgender bathroom debate i have that same sort of standard where i say look either either Gender and biological sex matters or it doesn't. If it exactly. does, you know, if it doesn't matter, then yeah, let's just unisex everything. You know, there is no men and women spaces at all. But if we're going to say that, yeah, biological sex does in fact matter and we do need these spaces, well, then we need to protect men's spaces with as much vigor as we are doing women's spaces. Absolutely. So that's sort of how I've always, I mean, that's sort of how I've seen it. It's like, we're, if you need to be principled on it. Either we're going to, either we're going to say that this matters and we're going to apply it across the board or we're not. Exactly. And we're really what it comes down to for the government is their own, they're not concerned about principles or consistency. They're concerned about what's going to get them the most power. And here's, I think, one of the greatest jokes of women's suffrage is that feminists try to argue that the reason they have the right to vote is because principled feminists fought and demanded and the men could just no longer resist and they earned the right to vote. That is garbage. If, me, if, if every man in America today simultaneously decided women weren't going to have the right to vote anymore, it would disappear overnight. So why do women have the right to vote? The answer to that is because politicians figured out that women vote tend to, can be manipulated to vote as a block and they are, uh, would be useful towards achieving certain political ends. Therefore, they gave them the right to vote. There is not a person in America, basically, if you if you look at various political parties and what their views on voting are, I guarantee you it comes down to they want people who they believe are going to vote for them to have the right to vote, and they want people who are going to vote against them to not have the right to vote. A great example, the end of the American Civil War. Uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln, all his life, was a noted white supremacist who said he never supported making voters out of black people. Yet, after the war and slavery was ended, the Republican Party suddenly pushed for uh, suffrage for African Americans in the South. Why? Because they knew that, they, that the South was largely controlled by the Democratic Party, and if they made voters out of the, out of the blacks in the South, the odds that, they, that their puppet rulers would get elected went way up. Why did Democrats you know, not support blacks being able to vote? 
largely for the same reason. They knew it would it would vote in Republicans. And you know, that seems like an extreme example to us today, but that's really all it comes down to. Uh, and, and it's ultimately why women earn, uh, the, the women did not earn the right to vote, but why men granted women the right to vote is enough men were convinced that women voting would serve their purposes. Well, yeah, and what people also fail to realize is that like voting is actually one of those rare things in American history where it was more seen like when men had the vote and women didn't, which was actually a short period of time in American history. Um, but it was always sold to men as a as a family responsibility and not like an individual thing. Exactly. Basically, basically, men were told, look, you are the head of this household. You are the representative of this household. It is your job to make sure that your family is taken care of and you need to vote within their interest. Exactly. Voting came with commensurate responsibility. And that's why I go back to if you're not paying taxes and you're not subject to the draft, you shouldn't be voting. Yeah. And so that's how, like, it's funny how, like, they seem to completely forget about that because that's how even it was sold in ancient Greece. It wasn't sold as, oh, well, you're a man, you're going to have this individual thing and you're going to get all these perks and benefits and all this, like, with it. Like, sure, you're going to get some benefits out of it. But overall, the point is, is that you're voting as a representative of your family. You're the head of your family and you have a duty to, to vote in the interest of your family. Absolutely. And, and like any, like they've made this funny, like there have been men's right activists that have pointed this out. They say, if any man seriously went, went to the polling booth and voted against his wife's interest, he would never hear the end of it. <laughs> like, can you imagine, like imagine putting yourself like in the, in the, like before, like a couple years before women got the vote, my two cents. And, you were married to a woman and you deliberately went up to a poll to vote against your wife's interest. Do you really think that you're, you're, you're going to have to be sleeping with your eye open for the rest of the night and for probably the weeks to come? And th ironically enough, many women who oppose women's suffrage said just that. They believe women had a greater ability to influence politics outside the formal voting arena. Yeah, and which is actually funny is they actually approved that because... I mean, if you think about it this way, even before women got the, the vote, you can find women winning political offices since 1898. Mm -hmm. Because what's funny in America is that there was no uniform law against women running for office. Women could, women could always run for offices. It's just like most women chose not to do that because... Exactly, and it was a question of whether or not they could get elected. Yeah. And so, like, there was no uniform law really saying, oh, women, you're not allowed to vote. You're not allowed to run for office. Like, we've had women run for president, I think, since 19, like, uh, since, um, I think, the 1930s, I think, was the first one. It could be before then. But I remember, like, I know the we can go to see, like, the first women that have ever gotten, like, a political position in the United States since 1898. And that was before the draft, I mean, not the draft, before the women got the vote and suffrage. So women could always get, like, you know, they could get political influence. They just had to seek it out. And most women just were not interested in that because, I mean, I think to many women, they figured, well, why am I going to take all the risk of being a politician when I can just get my husband to do it? Mm -hmm. but I think that's where it really came down to is because women just said, well, what, because why am I going to take all that? Cause like people also fail to realize that there tends to be an inverse relationship between power and privacy. The more powerful you get, the less privacy you tend to have. Would you generally agree with that? My two cents. Hello? Oh, sorry, my, my microphone was muted. My bad. Oh, that's um, fine. Yes, I, w I would say generally the more power you personally accrue, the less privacy you have in that the more power you accrue, the more interest other people tend to take in your life and the more difficult it becomes to have privacy. Yeah, and which is funny, they have actually have done studies on this in that women actually value privacy more than men do. Interesting. 
And I mean, which makes it interesting because I mean, what's the big argument that women give for wanting to have abortion rights in America, the right to privacy? privacy. And so women seem to be much more interested in privacy than men are. And, but here's the thing, that is where the trade-off comes in. If you're so focused on privacy, you're not going to want to take jobs where that might actually conflict with that. I would say, given the nature of uh, uh, how popular Instagram and such is these days, I question whether or not women value privacy much anymore, but... Well, uh, they say they do, but they often, their their words, like, and here's what's funny, is like, they'll often do things and not think about them later. They'll just think, oh, well, I'm going to be an Instagram model for, let's say, four or five, five years, cash out, and then everything's going to be hunky-dory. Mm-hmm. And then what ends up happening is, is that they do that where they do cash out at their five years and then they can't find a guy that will want to be with them. And then they'll be wondering why all the guys are staring at them and she has no more privacy anymore. I, I hate to make this reference, but I've got to. You're making me think of the episode of South Park that's making fun of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle uh, yeah. going on the worldwide privacy tour. <laughs> yeah. So say, so, well, why, why are these people interrupting our privacy? We just want privacy exactly. all the while. Flying around on our private jets, setting off fireworks, waving banners about privacy. Pay no attention to us. We just want privacy, yet we're doing everything possible to ensure that people pay attention to us. Yeah. And I think that's sort of how many women do work in America, Sally, where they say that they, because I often do point out like this is like a big thing also that when it comes to the abortion debate, it's also bodily autonomy and they say well look if you know they said if if men could get uh, if men could get pregnant then abortion would be considered a sacrament i'm like well for one you're making one assumption that men have bodily autonomy in america they don't fundamentally men don't have bodily autonomy in america because for one we're the only sex that's constricted to the gr- the draft that's one Two, women can rape men in ways that, where that if men did that, it would be considered rape against a woman. Three, circumcision, that's another one. And so, and so basically, oh, and the fact that the men are more likely to get sent to prison for things that women would get off on without prison. So, yeah, basically speaking, men don't really have bodily autonomy rights in America, at least not recognized. Indeed. So, uh, so I've always said, like, you know, try, like trying to take away a man's bodily autonomy in America is like trying to, to take away a slave's freedom. They don't have any to give in America. <laughs> because <laughs> well, that's good. It goes back that everyone is still effectively a slave to the government. It's just a question of whether or not you acknowledge it. Well, yeah. Well, I I made the like I made a joke to one of my black friends about that, and he he busted out laughing as well. Because I said, "What's the difference between a black person in the 1820s and a modern black person now in America?" I said, "A black person in the 1820s at least knew he was a slave to the Democrat Party. Modern black <laughs> oblivious to that." Exactly. And he busted out laughing with that. And, and I mean, well, what's funny even about that is like the, I think it's the 13th, 14th. I mean, the amendment that, that people say abolish slavery, there is a loophole is the prison loophole where it says slavery is abolished except when it comes to prison. So it still exists in some form. Now one could argue if one could argue so long as they're in prison, they deserved it but it nonetheless remains the case that they are they are uh being used as a slave well yeah i mean like yeah i mean and here's the thing it's not like i'm going to be completely you know up in tears about a a child molester or a rapist or a murderer being forced to you know make license license plates in prisons i'm not going to really be up in tears over that Um, my, like, you know, so I definitely think that I'm, I remember a thing, also a thing that I also, when I was talking to night shift about is 
a lot of um, air caps uh, seem not to know about what, like, the purpose of many times of what laws and, and contracts are for, which contracts very often are not to prevent the person from breaking them. It's more to have a written record for you to be able to appeal to when the person does break it. Exactly. Well, it's sort of like this. It's like, I use this example of the Concord Act that Pope Urban signed with Hitler, where basically there was this contract where the Pope signed with Hitler saying that, oh, well, you know, we'll make these this and this concession to you and you make this and this concession to us. And basically the Pope knew right off the gate that Hitler was not going to follow through with that. He knew that Hitler would, would, would break it. But the reason why he had Hitler sign it and do that sort of thing is that that way when Hitler did break it, he could say, well, look, we have this agreement. Like we have this agreement and he's breaking it. And so they could get more support that way. Exactly. Yeah. If it's, if it's word of mouth, you can't prove what was or was not said beforehand. Yeah, and so that's sort of how it went through because the Pope, the Pope knew that Hitler was not going to abide by any sort of contract, but it was more so that if when Hitler did break it, they could say, "Well, hey, look at this this document that we had him sign," and that's sort of like the entire reason why we have contracts in a lot of places is because if let's say me and you sign like um, an agreement for. Let's say, I don't know, maybe like a lemonade stand or something. And we agree to split the profits 50-50. The contract does, itself does not confirm magical powers that ensure that either one of us won't screw the other person over. It's just that if one of us does happen to screw the other person over, well, we have a written agreement where we can say, yeah, you're definitively in the wrong here. Whereas if it exactly. was just... Or if it was just word of mouth, you could go either way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I also see when it comes to discussions about what law is, a lot of people will say that, well, law is just a threat backed up with, a, like, it's just a rule backed up by a gun. And... I say that is true, but that's basically all rules in general. Like, like even assuming, let's say, we have in Capistan where there's no government at all, but there's private businesses. And let's say I own a, a sandwich shop and I want to put a sign out on my, on my door that says, hey, if, you know, no smoking in here. Well, the only way that that sign has any power and validity to it is if I'm willing to kick out someone that is, you know, smoking on my property. Exactly. And I think that's actually why uh, theorists like Hans Hermann Hoppe have said that in Ancapistan, what you effectively have is numerous small monarchies where every private property owner is effectively the king of his own miniature kingdom. Yeah. So that's why I've never found the whole thing about saying, well, laws are basically just, um, you know, basically they're just promises of force if he breaks something up. Because I'm like, that's all rules in general. I mean, because the only way that a, you know, if I say, a, you know, no smoking in my house, the only way that that rule has any validity at all is if there's some, you know, threat of force that if you were to smoke in my house. If if I had the rule up and I never threw anyone out, then it wouldn't really be a rule. Exactly. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Mm -hmm. So I think I more... Think the question is only whether the laws are just or unjust and are they derived from first principles of logic. Yeah. Then that thing that, and, and who's the actual authority in the matter? Mm -hmm. I think that's more what matters because even if you have something that is... Even if you're in the moral right about something, that doesn't necessarily mean you have the authority to act on it. Indeed. 
Um, and so, and I remember you said, so you talked about her, her like Hoppe. Um, how far do you go in your knowledge of him? Uh, my, my, I, I've not researched him as a man in detail. I have, I do have a copy of Democracy, the God that Failed. Oh, that's lovely. Well, I made this sort of observation. I said, well, what's the difference between a president and a king? A uh, Yes, a, a, pres- a bad president fears for his job. A bad king fears for his life. Yep, precisely. Basically, like I like to give this example. If Like Joe Biden right now with the inflation and everything. If, for example, Joe Biden, or let's just say anyone, even a Republican, let's say Trump or whatever. Like Biden, Trump, Democrat, Republican, whatever, whoever the, 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 the face is of the, the presidency. Like they could destroy the economy in such a way where it could take decades to repair it. And the worst thing that's really going to come across to, with Trump or any of these people is that they'll just have to sit out on an island or something. And that'll be the end of it. And they can just retire in luxury while everyone else in the economy is starving. Whereas in many monarchies, if a, even if a king tries to run away, like they'll literally track him down and kill him just so that he doesn't have a claim if he decides to come back. Mm-hmm. Now, I, the one thing I would say about democracy, the God that failed, I love how Hoppe presents the argument. Basically, he's saying, I'm not saying government itself is just. All I want to explore is the question of if we're going to have a government, uh, which one inherently provides for most freedom. And I think he's absolutely right in as much about the incentive structures that apply to an absolute monarch as opposed to the incentive structures that apply to the president. Now, does he necessarily succeed in establishing that monarchies are overall better than democracies? Uh, th- that matter is certainly debated, but I think what, he, uh, what you can't argue with is his assertion that when you have an absolute monarch, the kingdom's treasury, th- there is no difference between the king's private purse and the, and the crown's treasury. The crown's treasury is the king's private purse. Therefore, the king has a direct incentive to steward money the, the money of the crown and therefore of the kingdom in the same fashion that he would his own private bank account. Uh, on the other hand, publicly elected politicians who maintain their own private bank accounts as opposed to, but also control the public treasury are far more willing to blow out spending when it's the quote unquote public treasury and not their treasury and, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, like all, all those points he makes about the differences in incentive and how politicians are elected for a particular term have a direct incentive to milk the system as hard as they can for while they're in office, whereas someone who owns the system inherently and will ins- and will pass it on his relatives at some point uh, has a greater incentive to ensure long-term prosperity. And I remember, like, I remember, like, re- I actually have seen your Twitter before, and you've actually have gone over how you're pro-life okay. and. Yeah, and so am I. And what I do find interesting is like it, that you do like we actually do seem to be more of a minority in the Libertarian Party. Um, I think most Libertarians are pro-choice. Well, I have a whole series of those on my channel explaining why I think Libertarians should be pro-life. If anyone wants to check that out, yeah, I definitely recommend it. I know. Shane Killian, for example, is pro-choice. He is. And, um, I've watched some of his videos. I've never heard him give a really in-depth defense of why he's pro-choice. Based on some statements he's made, I think he's more in the camp of the Judith Jarvis Thompson bodily autonomy argument. Uh, I, I do explicitly address that argument in my fourth video, though, and why I don't think that one succeeds. Well, yeah. A one that I don't think that a lot of, an objection that, to that that I don't think a lot of people take into consideration is that if we were talking s- s- explicitly about women unplugging themselves, they might have a point. But we're not talking about women doing an abortion on themselves. We're talking about women going to a doctor and having that doctor do it. Exactly. And I I think really to sum up why the Judith Jarvis Thompson violinist analogy fails in that analogy, the person is only justified in detaching himself from the violinist. 
the the result the unfortunate result being the person the violinist then dies of a previously existing ailment that the uh, person attached had nothing to do with. That's not what an abortion is, though. Abortion is the violent killing of an unborn child, uh, not merely detaching uh, them. And and further, the unborn child is precisely where he belongs at this point in his development. Uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson's analogy would have been more analogous if the only way to detach is if the, if the person simply detaches himself from the violinist, the, uh, the unintended result being he dies of a previously existing physical condition, condition, that's one thing. But if the person, you know, pulls on a sword and slices the violinist's head off and then burns his body, that's entirely another thing. And that's far more analogous to what abortion actually is. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, my point really goes down to where, like, imagine if, you know, you were the woman and, you know, you found yourself attached to this violinist, but, and you wanted to unplug from this person, but the only way that you could unplug from this person is that you had to get the violinist's bodyguard to do it. You couldn't do it yourself. You had to go to the violinist's bodyguard. and. Even if you have the right to bodily autonomy, that would not mean that you would have the right to force the, the violinist's bodyguard, who has an incentive to keep the violinist alive, to do the job. Mm -hmm. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. All right, that's fine. Well... I got your little message in. We can go now because I'm going to be eating anyway. And I would say thank you for coming on to the show. It was nice talking to you, my bro. Oh, nice talking to you as well. It's a great conversation. Yeah. So make sure. To, oh, yeah. Before we go, tell the audience about um, where they can find you. What are your plans and the like? Okay. Well, um, as I said, I don't produce a lot of content anymore. Uh, I do do occasional podcasts every now and then, and I actually am talking about doing another one here in the near future with Night Shift 10,000. So you, you, on YouTube, you can find find me, uh, my two cents, just type in my two cents. There is actually, I know there's a much larger channel called My Two Cents. It's a financial channel. It was started after mine, so they stole the name from me. <laughs> but um, if you want to say My Two Cents Abortion, my abortion series is pretty popular. Uh, my Two Cents Traditional Marriage, my marriage series is pretty popular, and you can find all my content there. It's also available on BitChute. And then, but if you want to see uh, my you know, quirky little takes on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm pretty active on Twitter, uh, or I guess X as it's now called. And my handle there is at underscore my two underscore cents underscore. Sorry for all the underscores, but just playing My Two Cents was already taken. <laughs> yeah, well, that's nice. And it was great having you on, bro. This will definitely be up soon. And, and again, thanks for coming on. Thank you. And all right. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise. And this is my.